Today, I'd like to share with you how I'm going to be investing in 2023. In fact, this is how our team at Metropole will be helping our clients invest in property in 2023. Whether you're new to the game or you've already built a property portfolio, you're likely to benefit from what I'm about to share. That's because initially, I'm going to explain some of the frameworks that will be relevant no matter where you are in your investment journey. And even if you've heard them before, they may be a good reference point or maybe they're going to offer a new perspective from which to think about your own plans moving forward and what you could be doing. But then I'm going to share some concepts I I haven't discussed on this podcast before. I'm going to be explaining the three different categories of fundamentals that I take into account when making investment decisions. I'm going to speak about leading indicators, coincident indicators and lagging indicators. And if you don't understand the difference between these, it's going to be hard for you to get the right perspective from all the data the media keeps throwing at you. Now, regular listeners would know I usually have a guest on each show, but once a month or so, I have these chats, just you and me, where I hope to get lots of information across. And if you're new to this show, well, firstly, welcome. And if you find the information useful, I'd really appreciate it if you'd follow the show on whatever podcast app you're listening to. That will allow us to just update you each time a new show comes out. Okay, let's get on with it. In the meantime, let's find out about what I plan to do and how I plan to do things in 2023. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. As I explained in the introduction, I'd like to share with you how I'm planning to invest in 2023. Now, this may not be right for you. I'm at a much different stage of my investment career than you are at, but I hope this will give you a framework to work on because it's the same framework that we use for our clients at Metropole. So firstly, I'm going to focus on capital growth. Now, for as long as I've been investing, there's been the question about whether you should invest for capital growth or cash flow. Now, to be perfectly honest, I'm greedy. I want both. But there's no doubt in my mind the more important factor to focus on is capital growth because that's where the real wealth is made in property investment. Now, if you speak to anyone who's owned property for any length of time, particularly if they've been a successful property investor, and you ask them to work out how much rent they've collected and then work out how much they've kept after tax, after expenses, and then they compare that to the tax-free capital growth they've made, invariably the capital growth will be much, much more significant. Now, I understand that cash flow is important, especially in the current environment where interest rates are high, where the cost of owning properties is high as well. So you definitely need cash flow to keep you in the game, but it's actually capital growth that will get you out of the rat race in the long term. Moving forward, as our property markets move into the next stage of the property cycle, as they will later in this year, We're going to end up with a number of years of subdued capital growth. The markets aren't going to boom. The markets are going to be fragmented, and some areas are going to significantly outperform others with regard to capital growth. And in general, these are going to be areas where the locals are going to have higher incomes. They're not going to be as affected by rising interest rates. They're not going to be as affected by extra costs of living, and they're going to be able to afford to, and they'll be prepared to pay to live in those locations. And often, these are going to be in the gentrifying suburbs of our capital cities. So recognising that location of my investments is going to do around 80% of the heavy lifting, I'm going to remain focused on areas where I believe are primed for capital growth. Okay, the next focus for my investing in 2023 is going to be to only invest in a capital city. Now, sure, there's going to be investment opportunities in regional towns, and there's no doubt better locations in regional towns will outperform underperforming poor locations in our capital cities. But having said that, there will be more great opportunities in our three big capital cities where there's going to be economic growth, and that's going to lead to wages growth. Wages growth is going to drive population growth, and we know immigrants are coming, and they're coming for jobs, and they're going to, in general, want jobs with higher wages, and That's going to drive, in the long term, rental growth and then property growth. 
So I'll be looking for locations within those cities that are going to be in continuous strong demand by an affluent demographic, locations where people really want to live and aspire to live and are able to and prepared to pay to live there. Now, these should also be areas that are going to be in strong demand by affluent tenants, tenants who can afford to and are prepared to pay higher rents and Tenants are going to be able to do so over the long term. Remember, your future cash flow is going to be dependent on your tenant's ability to keep paying higher rents. Of course, these locations are likely to remain resilient through all stages of the property cycle too. This means I'm going to avoid investing in outer suburbs where more people are going to be living week to week, where they're going to be more affected by rising costs of living, the rising mortgage costs, rising rents, and wages not going up as much. I'm also going to avoid investing in potential future hotspots, which may or may not lead to short-term capital growth rather than long-term capital growth, because we know that this year's hotspots, next year's not spot. So as we discuss how I'm going to be investing in the coming year, I also want to explain that I'm going to be only investing in prime properties, what I call investment-grade properties, as this is the type of property that's going to grow the most, And it's also going to give you an easier ride along the way. But in my mind, less than 4% of properties currently on the market are what I'd call investment grade. Of course, there's plenty of investment stock out there, but don't confuse the two. You see, any property can become an investment property. Just kick out the landlord, put a tenant in, and it becomes an investment. But I'm only going to invest in properties that will generate wealth-producing rates of return. So what makes an investment-grade property? Well, a couple of things I'd look for are properties that will appeal to a wide range of affluent owner-occupiers. Now, I'm not planning to sell the property, but I want owner-occupiers to buy similar properties around mine and push up the value of my property. Investment-grade properties are also going to be in the right location. By this, I don't just mean the right suburb. We know suburbs are important, but also, I guess we're looking for a suburb with multiple growth drivers, but the properties are going to be a short walking distance to lifestyle amenities, cafe shops, restaurants and parks. You've heard me speak about neighbourhood character before. You've heard me speak about 20-minute neighbourhoods before. So these properties are going to be close to public transport. And that's going to be a factor that's going to become more important in the future as our population grows and as our roads become more congested and people are going to want to reduce commuting time. That's a trend we've seen happen overseas and it's going to happen here too. Okay, just going back to what makes an investment grade property, that probably would also have street appeal as well as a favourable aspect or good views. Investment grade properties tend to offer security. That's pretty important in today's environment. Firstly, by being located in the right suburb, but as well as having right security features such as gates, intercoms, alarms, and it would offer secure off-street parking. Of course, I like properties with a high land-to-asset ratio. Now, This is very different to the amount of land. I'd rather own a sixth of a block of land under my apartment building in a great suburb like Bondi or Coogee overlooking the beach or a good inner suburb rather than a large block of land in regional Australia. And again, I'd also want the type of property that gives me the potential to add value, which is the next of the factors I'm going to look for when I'm investing in property. And interestingly, as I said, that's the factors we look for when we help our clients invest in property. Over the next few years, it's likely that we're going to have a period of subdued capital growth. So rather than waiting for the market to do the heavy lifting, I'd only buy the sort of property to which I could add value through renovations or development. Now, that doesn't actually mean you've got to undertake the renovation or the development right away, but I like to buy properties that have got upside potential. In fact, I've just completed a two-townhouse development in a bayside suburb of Melbourne, which Pam and I are holding as long-term investments, and we're just commencing a subdivision and a two-house development in a a suburb of Brisbane. In both cases, manufacturing significant capital growth. So as I go through how I am investing this year, I hope it's giving you some clues, because most people would think I'm a pretty successful property investor. Boy, have I made my share of mistakes, but over the 50 years I've been investing, I've fine-tuned my strategies. So I only buy properties that fit in with my long-term investment strategy. Now, again, it's important to realize that property investment's a process, not an event. 
In fact, it's a long-term process. It's likely to take 20 to 30 years to develop a big enough asset base to give you the cash flow for the type of lifestyle you desire. Now, the difference between an average property investor and a strategic property investor is that most property investors find a property they like somewhere close to where they live or where they want a holiday or where they want to retire. They sometimes look at some data to justify their preconceived decisions. Now, that's an emotional decision. and We all know emotions and investments don't mix too well together. On the other hand, strategic investors start the investing process with a plan in place. In fact, you need a plan. Attaining wealth doesn't just happen. It's the result of a well-executed plan. Planning is bringing your future into the present so you can do something about it now. So just to make things clear, buying an investment property is not a strategy. It's not just a plan. It's important to start with the end game in mind and understand what you need, what you want to achieve, what your time frames are, what your risk profile is, and then you have to build a plan, a strategy to get there. You see, the property you eventually buy will be the physical manifestation of a whole lot of decisions that you're going to make, and you've got to make them in the right order. Now, if you're a beginner looking for a time-tested investment strategy, or even if you're an established investor, maybe you're stuck, or maybe you're just wanting a second opinion, an objective opinion on your current situation, will it get you to where you want to get to? I suggest you allow my team at Metropole to build you a personalized, customized, strategic property plan. You see, when you've got a plan, you're going to be more likely to achieve the financial freedom you desire because we're going to help you, well, first of all, define your goals. We're going to make them more specific. Then we're going to see how they're realistic, especially for your time frames. We're also going to measure your progress towards your goals, whether your property portfolio is working for you or if you're working for it. We'll find ways to maximize your wealth creation through property and part of the strategic plan is to identify risks you hadn't thought of. And the real benefit is you're going to be able to grow your wealth through your property portfolio faster and more safely than the average investor. So why not go to metropole.com.au and learn about the service and discuss your options? I'm going to leave a link in the show notes. Now, a plan actually has many components. You've possibly heard me discuss this in past podcasts, but there's an asset accumulation strategy, a manufacturing capital growth strategy. I've already explained how we believe that's an important part for many investors, a rental growth strategy, an asset protection and tax minimization strategy. These are all parts of the plan. A finance strategy to see you through the ups and downs. We help our clients not just buy property, but buy time by having the right finance strategies. And then finally, a living off your property portfolio strategy. So why not go to metropole.com.au and find out about how we do this. Now, back to what I'll be investing in and how I'll be investing this year. Again, I've mentioned a few times I'm going to be focusing on the long term because to help investors this year, you, investors, are going to need to focus on the long term as well because if you let yourself get scared and distracted by all the noise in the media and the media is going to keep throwing messages at you this year, it's possible. In fact, it's likely you're going to do nothing. I see this year as another year of mixed messages as the media realises that the world's economies and Australia's economy is still going to be facing many headwinds. However, I believe eventually inflation is going to come under control this year and interest rates are going to stop rising and then our property markets will reset and a whole new property cycle is going to begin as buyers and sellers regain their confidence and enter the market. But during times of transition like this, the media gives us mixed messages, confusing messages, and there's no doubt that the property naysayers are going to be out there having a wild time telling us how property markets are going to crash again. But that's always the case, isn't it? Over the years, I've found that there are better investment opportunities available at times like this, when there is confusion, when there is concern, compared to booming periods like we experienced in 2020-21, when FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, caused buyers to pay a premium and make decisions that some of them are now going to regret, but it was hard to get good opportunities then. Of course, there's no point in trying to time the market. There's no point trying to judge the performance of your portfolio or your property that you're about to buy in the short term either. Because if you've got long-term focus, and remember, that's what I'm talking about at the moment, and you plan to hold your property, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years or, or forever, 
It is the value goes down a little bit in the short term before the market starts to rise later this year. It really won't matter in the long term. Much, much more important is going to be the quality of your asset and its long-term future growth potential. In other words, if it's the right investment to hold for the next decade, then perfect timing, perfect entry point into the market will make very, very little difference. Now, I know intuitively most people will nod along and agree with what I'm saying. Yes, you're right, Michael, timing isn't that important, but I found it very it's very difficult for many people to take action when the media is full of negative messages. So the best way to overcome this type of procrastination is, as I've said a few times now, to focus on the long term and make your investments part of a long-term strategic plan, as I've discussed. Now, another way I'll be focusing on property this year, and you should also, is by understanding how property really works. Now, I guess I'm going to be treating my property investments as a business rather than as a set and forget asset. But many people misunderstand what I mean when I say treat your property investments as a business because they think it means it's going to generate cash flow like a business. But as I've tried to explain, residential property investment is a strategy to grow your wealth in the long term, not to generate wealth or cash flow in the short term. Residential real estate is not an asset class which churns out sufficient cash flow to support your lifetime in the short term. So your long-term property journey is likely to consist of four phases. Firstly, the education phase, where you're learning about what to do and understanding about finance and understanding about economics. The next stage is the asset growth stage of your investment life, and that can take up to 20 years or more as you grow an asset base. The third stage is when you have a substantial asset base, you then enter the transition stage where you slowly lower your loan-to-value ratios, and then finally, you can live off your cash flow of your property investments and your other assets, and over time you should build other assets as well. In other words, you're initially going to have to make money elsewhere through your job or through your profession and move it into property. However, unfortunately on the internet, you're going to hear the opposite. You're going to get those messages from Spruikers in your inbox telling you how residential real estate can generate cash flow in the short term and you can make it into a property business. No, that's not how property works. You use your property to grow your wealth, but not generate wealth or surplus cash flow in the short term. The other thing I'm going to do this year is understand how the market is being driven by consumer sentiment you know, about how buyers and sellers feel about their own financial situation and what they anticipate the future is going to hold. Now, if you've been following real estate for a couple of years, you know that market sentiment can change really, really quickly. But market sentiment does make a big difference into what's ahead for property. So there are three types of indicators we look for at Metropole. We look for leading indicators, coincident indicators and lagging indicators. Maybe I should explain what that means. Leading indicators present economic data that point to the future direction of the economy and our property markets. Things such as consumer confidence, business confidence, share market indices, because that tells us what people are thinking about and gives us an indication of what's going on. Coincident indicators reflect the current state of the economy, showing whether it's in a state of growth or contraction. Things such as GDP, which indicates the country's overall economic performance. Personal income growth, what's happening if incomes rise, that indicates a healthier economy. And when incomes lag inflation, that suggests slower growth ahead. With regard to property, auction clearance rates are a good in-time indicator of property buyer and seller sentiment. And then there are lagging indicators, things that have taken place in the past, key economic events often confirming what's happened. Things such as interest rates, which respond to inflation. When rates rise, they slow economic growth. As we know, they discourage borrowing. Typically, they signal, though, that our economy is strong. On the other hand, low interest rates promote economic growth. Things like consumer price index, the CPI, actually is a lagging indicator. It's a measure of inflation, but Firstly, it shows us what's happened a month ago or two or three months ago with the quarterly CPI figures, and that's why the Reserve Bank's having trouble understanding how well its higher interest rates are affecting inflation at the moment. 
Another lagging indicator is unemployment. Uh, look, this has got many spill-on effects impacting consumer confidence, consumer spending, and in turn retail spending and the GDP. But the unemployment rate tells us what's happened a month or two ago. So we actually look at a whole lot of fundamentals. And as I said, we sort of break them up into leading, coincident, and lagging indicators. But supply and demand is a very important fundamental related to our property markets. In fact, it's one of the major factors affecting property prices in the short term. And we know that currently there's an undersupply of dwellings in the rental market, causing a crisis which is showing up with historically low vacancy rates, and that's, of course, causing higher rents. Now, close to 8 million Australians live in the 3.3 million rental properties, which are in general provided by mum and dad investors. But currently, there's only around... 32,000 dwellings for lease in Australia. There's never been such, well, it's been decades since we've had such low vacancy rates. We also know there's an undersupply of well-located homes and investment-grade properties for people who want to buy. There's less stock on the market, and this is also going to underpin property values. At the moment, discretionary home sellers are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what transpires. And as I've suggested, I believe later this year there is going to be a reset of the market as people realise, hey, interest rates are not going to get any higher. Or inflation's under control and people are then going to move into the market and the next cycle will start. That's why I currently see a window of opportunity. If you're keen to buy your next home, this is a great time because if you're upgrading in particular, the value of the more expensive homes has dropped more than medium price homes, so you've probably got a good opportunity to upgrade at a great time in the cycle. If you're planning to invest, as I've already said, don't try and time the cycle. Take advantage of the market before the next wave starts. Again, as we're talking about the fundamentals, we're looking at population growth is important and international borders have opened and overseas migration is surging. It's forecast to include 200,000 permanent migrants plus a further 500,000 international students in the next 12 months alone. Now, of course, these immigrants don't bring houses with them, so this will only exacerbate our current undersupply situation. As we're looking at the fundamentals that are going to be affecting our property market, we keep a careful track at Metropole of new dwelling construction. We've got some very detailed research of every suburb in Australia, and not just capital cities, but regional areas as well. But we, as I said earlier on, concentrate on the big capital cities. But boy, is there a difference between suburb to suburb? It has to do with demographics. It has to do with future potential population growth, supply and demand. We look for areas where wages are outperforming the average, where there's a higher proportion of owner occupiers than tenants. So we look at a whole lot of factors, including new dwelling construction. Now, during the pandemic, we know that there are a whole lot of incentives that pushed first home buyers into the market. And we know the government's got this desire to build 200,000 new and affordable dwellings each year commencing in 2024. Let's see how they do that. They still haven't come up with any stories about that. But we also know the cost of residential construction has risen substantially over the last few years, in part because of the lack of available skills, but also due to supply chain restrictions. This means the cost of building, particularly new apartments, has risen to such an extent that most developments on the drawing board just aren't going to be built. They're not currently financially viable and won't be built until the market's prepared to pay substantially more than the current prices. This means there's no end in sight to the undersupply of dwellings. Another fundamental we closely watch is employment. The current unemployment rate is very low, the best in decades, meaning Australians can feel secure about their financial future. Now, while the unemployment rate may rise moving forward due to skilled migrants being imported through immigration, it's still likely to remain in the region of 4 4.5%, an enviable result, something we never thought we'd get to a couple of years ago. Currently, there are over 470,000 jobs advertised, unfilled jobs available, and no one to take them up. So while the national average wages have underperformed inflation over the last couple of years, in other words, real wages have fallen, real as opposed to, because what we're looking at is comparing wages to inflation, it's likely we're going to move into a time when we experience moderate wages growth. We also look at other fundamentals at Metropole, things like how our economy is performing. And even though 
rising interest rates, the Reserve Bank trying to slow inflation, is going to dampen the economy. The Reserve Bank, I guess, is on a bit of a tightrope trying to slow growth, tame inflation by raising rates without slowing our economy too much. On balance, it seems that our economy is going to remain solid, but the growth is going to be slower. We also look at household finances, and while rising interest rates and inflation has eaten away at the average household budget, in general, Aussies have got more equity in their home than they had before the pandemic started three years ago. They've got considerably more savings stashed in their savings in the offset accounts than they had at the beginning of the pandemic three years ago. And despite the Reserve Bank's best efforts to slow down household spending, we're still spending up pretty big on discretionary items, things like clothes, food, restaurants, lifestyle. And despite the sharpest rise in interest rates over 2022 that we experienced, home loan arrears remain at post-GFC lows. They've defied the property pessimists who forecast significant mortgage stress that would lead to forced sales by homeowners. Now, I know some people who've locked in their fixed interest rates are going to hurt a bit later this year when they come out of their two-year locked fixed interest rate loans, but the banks aren't going to suddenly become mortgages in positions they don't want to be. So on balance, household finances in good condition. One of the factors we look at as we just look at the fundamentals for where we should be investing in property at Metropole is demographics. And you know that I regularly have a chat with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher because I believe demographics is going to be a major factor in where we should be investing. Now, during the COVID pandemic, many Australians moved to regional Australia, but this trend seems to now be reversing. However, moving forward, I still think we're going to have that hybrid work model that's going to see the work from home trend persist, meaning we're looking for larger homes, homes that can accommodate private work areas. And moving forward, we also pay a lot of attention to neighbourhood. We want not just 20-minute neighbourhoods, but great neighbourhoods, because I guess that's another COVID-related property trend likely to remain, the fact that we want the ability to work, live and play, all within 20 minutes reach. We all know that neighbourhood does, oh, location does 80% of the heavy lifting. And as I've explained, some neighbourhoods moving forward are going to outperform 50 to 100% with regard to capital growth. And that's partly because affluent Australians are going to be able to afford to and willing to pay to live in the right neighbourhood. Many in the suburbs of Australia's capital cities and part of the middle suburbs already meet this 20-minute neighbourhood test. However, very few of the outer suburbs are going to be able to do so. It's not just walkability, but it's also they just don't have the sufficient amenities or even sufficient people living there to support the amenities. Things like public transport and multiple uh, sorts of supermarkets and all the amenities the inner suburbs have got. Neighbourhood's always been an important factor. So how do you choose a great neighbourhood? In my mind, there are a number of factors we look for. I've already mentioned it, proximity to public transport, that's important. Good schools are very important. Many buyers will pay a premium to be in the catchment area of particular schools. Accessible amenities, people will pay a premium. Well, some people can afford to pay a premium to live near the right shops, the right restaurants, the right gyms, the beach. When you're choosing a neighbourhood, low crime rate's important. You want houses that are well maintained. Areas that have got planned upgrades where the council is looking to improve amenities. And many neighbourhoods that have got historic charm are going to always be in strong demand as well. So, boy, that's actually a long list of things that I look for and our team at Metropole look for when we're planning to invest in this upcoming year. And as I said, there are going to be challenges, but there's also going to be a time of great opportunity. And as I see it, a window of opportunity, while there's still negative messages out there at the moment, because eventually interest rates are going to peak. When There's been a couple of months when the Reserve Bank doesn't raise interest rates anymore. People are going to think, hey, this is it. I can get back into the market. Or when inflation's under control, people are going to feel more comfortable as well. Now, inflation's not going to die down instantly, but it's going to be lower inflation that's going to cause the Reserve Bank to hold off raising interest rates anymore. 
Having said that, one of the tendencies I started noticing at the end of last year and now the beginning of this year is a lot of home buyers and investors are saying, okay, there's only going to be one or two more rate rises. They're factoring that into their budgets and they're planning to get into the market before the crowd do. If you look back over the last couple of years, well, let's go back to 2020 when uh, all of a sudden the property market changed from doom and gloom to a boom or go back to 2019 after the federal election when people were scared about buying property and suddenly changed, or going back even further, it's interesting how consumer sentiment, market sentiment, changes quickly. And when it does, all of a sudden, more people turn up to open for inspections, more people buy at auctions, and eventually prices start rising. Initially, they stabilise. Well, we're already seeing an evidence of this with more interest. We've not had as many clients approaching us at Metropole for a long time as they are now saying, hey, I want to get into the market, both home buyers and investors. And we're seeing this with asking prices holding up at a time when there's little stock on the market. So if you want to take advantage of the current property cycle, go to metropole.com.au, find out how we can help you. And it all starts by putting a strategic plan together for you and we look forward to being part of your ongoing wealth creation journey because we can help you safely traverse these challenging times because we've been there before. In fact, I'm really proud of my team that's won multiple awards last year as Australia's most trusted bias agents. In a moment, I'm going to share with you my popular mindset message. But before I do, may I ask you a very direct question? Is your current peer group really supporting your goal of taking your property investment or your business or your life in general to the next level, to where you want it to be? You see, I found too many Australians get stuck and simply don't have the peer group or the advisor network to help them get to the next level. Well, here's your chance. Here's your chance to upgrade your peer group and get access to a whole other level of advisors. I'm recommending you join us at Wealth Retreat 2023 at the end of April and meet a new peer group of determined and successful property investors and business owners who are looking for a concrete roadmap to step up, not not just one, but many levels. Plus, you're going to learn the real-world realities of taking advantage of the property market reset that's going to happen later this year as a new cycle commences. Now, this is a I don't know, once in every now and then opportunity. Last time this happened, last time we had the beginning of a new property cycle, fortunes were made. So if you're interested in joining us at Wealth Retreat 2023, which is going to be held on the Gold Coast on April 29th to May 3rd, go to wealthretreat.com.au. Learn about it and register your interest. Every year, attendees come across things they knew some things they knew they didn't know, and a heap of things they didn't even know they didn't know. And that's because once a new topic was introduced, it opened up a whole Pandora's box of new information. By the way, you can't book in. We'll call you and make sure it's right for you. But you'll also lock into one of the few early bird specials that are left. So go to wealthretreat.com.au, learn more about it and register your interest. And if you really do want to join us, I'm going to chat with you personally to make sure you're going to benefit. And if you do, if it will be for you, I'll back Wealth Retreat 2023 with my money-back guarantee. I look forward to seeing you there. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. My mindset message today is about the P word. Today's inspiration is really a blog post from Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, who talked about the P word, which is patience. Gary V said, that's the magic word, and that's going to unlock most of your problems. He said, I understand why patience is hard, because so many of you want to prove it. You want to prove yourself to your mom, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your best friend, or to your boss. And he went on to say, the single best trait you can develop as an operator, an entrepreneur, a friend, a girlfriend, a wife, a daughter, a husband, a co-worker, or an employee is patience. Gary V said, there are very few concepts that I return to more than the idea of patience. Nine times out of ten is the answer to every question I get asked, he said. So many of you are wasting your days while worrying about your years. You're acting fast in the micro and deploying patience in the macro, said Gary V. It's also something most young people 
don't want to deploy. Patience must be your foundation, said Gary V. It's so hard, but it's worth it. You must believe that life is long. There are just way too many of you acting as if it ends tomorrow, and that if you don't get there right this second, then you never will. That if you don't get that promotion, that raise, that introduction, that car, that watch, the vacation, you never will. Trust me, said Gary V. That's not true. He said, you have to understand that you've got so much time. Whether you're 14 or 44, patience is the answer, said Gary V. You have to play the long game, but move insanely fast each day. That's why I always joke about being a tortoise in a hare's costume. He said, my outlook is in 10, 20 or 30 years terms, but my execution is micro. It's all about making decisions. Micro speed, macro patience. Gary V said, if you know what you want, then you're good to go. Reverse engineer goals and don't waver. Anything great takes time. Develop the work ethic, the mindset and the stamina to succeed, said Gary V. If you really understand what you want, then all you have to do is deploy patience. Too many say no before they say yes. Gary V said, if I told you that in 15 years you'd have a perfect life and all you had to do was work 15 hours a day every day for the next 10 years, all of you would do it. The reason you don't do it is because you're uncertain as to where that work's going to lead. This is where you deploy patience, enjoy the process and put in the work, was the message from Gary V. Now, interestingly, that fits in with a common theme that you've heard me talk about, and that theme is delayed gratification. If you do the easy things now, you're going to have a hard life later. But if you do the hard things now, you're going to have an easy life later. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 